Uh, my name is Jim Mann. I, uh, I'm a, currently a planetarium lecturer at Santa Monica College. I'm a longtime amateur astronomer. I, I come to astronomy from really the hobbyist end. Later on, I wound up working as a, as a uh, technician, then a department manager, then a process engineer at the company that made all those big rocket engines in Canoga Park. It was called Rocket Dime. It's been bought by various corporations. Okay, so the first question I had was, just to start off, who do you think is the biggest player in the space industry right now? Is it a country or is it a company? That kind of thing. Um, it, things are really interesting right now because, of course, the obvious answers are the big guys. When you talk about the space industry, of course, you've got old space with the big corporations like Boeing and Lockheed. And they, of course, are powerful and have the big contracts. Like Lock, Lockheed Martin has a contract for the Orion crew exploration vehicle. Boeing's got a lot of contracts that they've been doing a lot of screwing up on. They were like this juggernaut that was eating everybody up. And we thought, wow, Bo it's going to be nothing but Lockheed Martin and Boeing. And that's all they'll be left because all these corporations are just absorbing one another. And Boeing seems to have lost its way. But then you've mm -hmm. got, of course, New Space. And, and, and the, the seminal figure in New Space is, of course, Elon Musk, you know, who's he's brilliant with electric cars. He's brilliant with he wants to do the, the Hyperloop, but he wants to do the, the, the boring company and he wants to do it all. I think he's got I think his intellect is his fizzing. He has moved the needle that I hoped would be moved for a long time. I mean, all the years I built, I worked on space shuttle. I desperately wanted space flight to become more routine and cheaper so more of us could go. And nothing I did accomplished that. And here comes Musk and bam, we've got reusable boosters. And people laughed at him early on and now they're not laughing anymore. But the guy who I think is, might be more likely to be around longer is Bezos. Mm -hmm. He has very deep pockets. He's very quiet. Um, he, I just you never hear anything about them. Really, no, in the news. He, uh, and that's on purpose. The, the, the motto of, of Blue Origin is gradatum ferocitor in, in Latin, which, and their, their, their logo is a pair of tortoises rampant, you know, and it's, and it's, and it translates into step by step ferociously is the rough Latin translation. So they were very quiet until they, until they started flying their, their prototype of that suborbital rocket they, they fly. And you can go look at the videos from inside that capsule. So they've got a, they've got a working suborbital capsule. Um, to get that with that little booster that they, could, they call New Shepard, it's kind of a squat, uh, kind of uh, large diameter booster. The, the interesting thing is their first large engine was a liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen engine. And hydrogen is difficult to work with. The reason people bother with it is it's a really good in-space propulsion system. It's not great for a booster because it's bulky. Hydrogen is very low in density, so you want it with a big, large diameter tank. And aerodynamics aren't great, but it has, it's very efficient for a given amount of mass Hydrogen makes a lot of a lot of impulse per unit mass, and um, and you're really only making very angry steam. So environmentally, it's very clean. We like the fact that we had a non-toxic propulsion system, but very efficient. So, but but hydrogen is tough because it's a little tiny molecule. It'll leak through anything. It's really difficult to work with, and it's minus four twenty three Fahrenheit. So it's very cold, and and which is tough on materials. So you've got minus 423 and your exhaust temperature might be 6,000 degrees or whatever. So it, the, the, the thermal problems are pretty big. Yeah. Difficult first engine. And, they, and I, some people I know, know wound up going up and working for him. That was interesting. They, they tackled that difficult engine. Now he has a liquid hydrogen engine. That same engine is going to be adop adapted for the upper stage of his new, his new Glenn, which is his big orbital booster. He's building a LOX methane engine just like Elon is. And both of these billionaires are building methane burners because methane is um, cleaner than kerosene. It's almost the same temperature as liquid oxygen, which means the thermal shocks in the system are less. It's denser than hydrogen. Um, it's pretty cheap. And um, it's pretty easy theoretically to make it on Mars. 
out of the Martian atmosphere and, and local Martian water. So if you're aiming for Mars, there's a lot to recommend methane. And environmentally, there's a lot to recommend methane because you can actually use liquefied natural gas as almost pure methane. So watch out for, and Jeff Bezos is also selling his engine to United Launch Alliance, which is the company that runs the Delta IV and the Atlas V for the US government right now. So Bezos is about to unleash a new methane burner that's gonna be competing with SpaceX's Raptor. Watching, watching those two, you know, we're going to have dueling space billionaires. But there's yeah. a bunch of small companies coming up now, uh, like Electron and Firefly. There's all these small companies that are coming up for small satellites. So that's, that's a really interesting part of the industry, too. Do you think, in terms of the private space industry, that competition will be a good thing? Or do you think that it might, make, it might in, invoke careless mistakes? I think that competition is a good thing because otherwise you would still have the same corporations getting the government contracts and nobody ever would have bothered to push for lower costs for launch or, um, or reusable boosters. There's a lot of things you could do like use smaller, cheaper, more flexible rockets and build getting out into the solar system at a low earth orbit. It's all about fuel mass. If you're, if you're going to use chemical rockets, which is kind of what we have. We could do other stuff. We could do light sails. We could do ion propulsion. There's all kinds of ways to go. If we're taking people to get from where the space station is, low Earth orbit, out to the moon or any place beyond, to near Earth asteroids, or if you really want to go to Mars, um, you got to get through the, the Van Allen radiation belts fairly rapidly. So some of the really efficient ways of going, which are low thrust, high efficiency, ion engines or light sails, they would have to, they would have to kind of spiral out slowly. They're, they're good for cargo, but for humans, humans can't be that patient. You got to jet through the belts pretty fast or you get fried. And that's the thing that the, the people who say that the moon landing was fake, that's one of their reasons that it yeah, has to be fake. It's, it's impossible. It's not impossible. Radiation exposure. You, yeah, they're right. You can't live in the Van Allen belts. You'll die. But, if you go through at 24,000 miles an hour, yeah, you get dosed. But your exposure time is not high. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that people who are airline pilots, high-performance jet pilots, astronauts on the station, that doesn't mean they don't get more radiation than you and I do at sea level. They do. They have long ago accepted that medical risk. What the risk is going to – what the what the increased risk was for the – uh, for the people who walked on the moon, I mean, 12 humans, 12 men walked on the moon and a, a, a larger number flew out there. Uh, the, some people made the trip twice. You know, Jim Lovell went twice but didn't land because his landing didn't happen on Apollo 13. John Young went twice because he went on Apollo 10 and up on Apollo 16. There were a few guys that went twice. It was such a small sample group, they don't know statistically really how much risk there was they were in a high risk group anyway. Guys in that group probably are gonna show a higher cancer rate. Okay, just because you're in a higher radiation environment. Yeah. Only when we get large numbers of people out there can medical science tell you what the real increase in risk is. One thing I would say to people who wanna jump on Starship with Elon and go to Mars and establish that first colony, I say, good on you. If I was 18, I'd wanna do it too, but now I'm older and a little bit more understanding of the risks. And I would wait to the third or fourth wave when they have better radiation shielding when you get to Mars. Because when you get to Mars, you, you're going to live in a place. If they do colonize Mars successfully, as a planet, Mars has all kinds of things, all kinds of resources, but it doesn't have a strong magnetic field. There is no large molten core creating this, this uh, magnetic field that shields you from a lot of the radiation hazards. And that's going to be a problem. And we have no idea what the long-term effects are. So yeah, multi-planet species, I'm right there with you. I just think Elon might be in a bit, bit too much of a hurry to head to Mars. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a great resource place, but there's other resources closer. I'm a big advocate of, of airless rocky bodies right now as, our, as being within our technological capability easily 
I'm absolutely in, in favor of humanity moving out in the solar system. I think we need to get off this planet. We need to start utilizing resources off this planet. And I'm a big fan of strip mining dead, airless, rocky bodies rather than living biospheres. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, <laughs> we're fouling the nest. But I'm not so sure Mars is the first place I want to go. Yeah. I think there's a lot of really, there's a lot of resources in places in airless rocky bodies. And I mean, the moon's three days away by, by free fall rocket. We now know there are polar ice deposits with, with we don't know the quantities of the form. Might be gardened into the regolith, that fine soil in the form of crystals, or it might be relatively thick solid deposits in those shattered craters. We need some like ground. glaciers. Yeah, maybe not actual glaciers, but if it's, if it's deposits a few feet thick, that's massive. I mean, with the modern rockets, I don't know how many thousand dollars a pound it takes to get something to the surface right now. I mean, the standard we used to quote for low Earth orbit was $50,000 a pound. Okay, excuse me, $10,000 a pound, $50,000 to the lunar surface was the old standard. They can beat that. But let's say, let's say we can manage $10,000 a pound to the lunar surface. A gallon of water weighs eight pounds. So $80,000 a gallon? <laughs> and with water, you've got hydrogen, you've got oxygen, you can make concrete out of, they already have prototyped concrete out of lunar regolith. Yeah, and they stretch. can like 3D print that stuff too. Yeah, I mean, I mean, with that capability, is it, You've, you've got feedstocks available from, from local reed sources. You've got breathing air, you've got water, you can irrigate, you bring this, the fertilizer at the poles. Not only is it a good place to get those volatiles like water, there may be methane and ethane and ammonia too. So if you've got a, a, a sophisticated small chemical laboratory, not only is it your gas station, it can also be a restaurant. And, and with 3D printing technology, Lunar rocks are high in aluminum, high in oxygen. A solar concentrator can split things out. You centrifuge it. You can do all kinds of cool stuff. The moon can be your bootstrap to get you a lot of places. And it's a, it says it's airless. You can throw things into orbit basically with a really powerful version of the Superman ride at Magic Mountain. Yeah. You can, you can use magnetic catapults to throw dirt up to collection points for in-space manufacturing. There's, I mean... That's kind of where Bezos is coming from, because he, he's going off of a concept that dates back to the 70s, uh, a physicist named Gerard O'Neill, who had this concept that a planetary surface is probably not the best place for developing industrialized civilization, at least a, a planetary surface of the biosphere. His idea was get the dirty industries off planet, um, and one of the industries that could be crucial for for space-based is solar power satellites built out of lunar materials. So you've got these, these satellites grabbing sunlight and beaming power back to Earth or colonies on the moon or wherever, sending the power wherever needed, and it's a totally clean power for solar energy, and you can stop burning fossil fuels. And when I was just out of college, if that had been happening, I would have signed up in a heartbeat. I was, re I was like ready to go if Jerry O'Neill was going to lead us off to build those, those L5 colonies. <laughs> Didn't happen. It would have required funding like Apollo for probably 20 to 25 years to get the yeah, first yeah. ones going. But that, that's why I was bummed. It didn't happen. So the next uh, major topic that I wanted to ask you about is because currently the, uh, to my understanding at least, currently the treaties we have in place say that nobody owns space. But obviously, once Elon and Bezos and China and U.S. and everybody get, starts going out there again, we're going to have to update some stuff because people want to mine and colonize and build and all that. Space law is going to become a really fascinating field, I think. And the idea of property. I mean, they're saying nobody can own the moon, yet there seems to be a consensus that resources can be utilized. Yeah. And I don't know how you reconcile those two statements somebody's i mean if you're deriving 
benefit from it and you're trying to encourage commercialization, somebody's going to be wanting to make a buck. Yeah. And I don't think I, I, I obviously there's, there's a dissonance in those two ideas. So, cause it's not going it, to places like the moon are not going to remain like Antarctica. Yeah. And even on earth, you know, like look at what's, look at how people are, countries are jostling each other into what used to be the other, Countries are altruistic until you can get someplace. I mean, look at the Arctic used to be pristine and unreachable. Now, now, every, now the ice is melting because we're screwing up with, with, car, with, with carbon uh, emissions and everybody's scrambling to figure out how they can drill for oil in the Arctic oceans. You know, um, I think the moon's going to be as pristine as people, prist, or it's going to be pristine and untouched until people can get rich. And that's kind of what scares me because as a species, we have a really rapacious streak. And I don't know how you control some of our worst impulses. If you look at what happened to the American West, when the, the energies of unbridled capitalism were unleashed, <laughs> it could get scary. So you can wind up with a dystopian thing with the billionaires in charge, or you can wind yeah. up with a, 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 a John Muir image or, or vision or something in between, you know, I mean, yeah. Well, some people might argue that because there's no life on the moon and nobody lives there, what's the problem with ruining it? What do you have to say to that? I'd say vandalism is never attractive and we should be better than that as a species. I, th I think there's ways, to, there's ways to utilize resources without, without being, being vandals, essentially. Um, yeah, yeah. Will will what we do on the moon be visible? Yes, but do we need to be indiscriminately destructive in the process? I th I think we can probably find a balance about how we use the resources. But yeah, I I do agree that if there's no life on the moon, that removes one problem. That's one of my big ethical issues with Mars. We don't know if there's a biosphere on Mars. There may be microscopic life forms on Mars. And in the act of sending the first humans there, I mean, we may already have con contaminated Mars as it is because our planetary protection protocols on Mars are probably not as good as we think they are when we send landers. Um, we may have violated planetary protection protocols when we sent Curiosity because there were some last minute stuff done on the pad that upset some people just before they launched her. Um, but the first time we send a human, um, inevitably, it's over. yeah, it's we're done because our bodies are complex. Not just us, our our internals are full of all kinds of flora and fauna. We 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 have all these organisms inside us. I mean, we're we're walking we're walking ecosystems, and the presence of humans on the surface, it's it's I don't I don't I just don't have any confidence we can contain that. Yeah, we bet. I, I think I think that I don't want Elon to, to shoot off, go off to Mars with 50 people before we know whether there's life on Mars, because I think that's profoundly important. We need to know with a fair degree of certainty if life, life evolved there. There's even that possibility that life evolved on Mars first and then seeded Earth with, 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 with DNA based life that that may have a, that may be the way things went. And never being able to be sure about that, I think that would be a terrible loss for science. And there's lots of other places to get resources from. So personally, I'm a, I'm a let, let's go to school on the moon guy because there's lots of other airless rocky bodies out there. And the moon's a great place to learn how to operate there. In those other airless rocky bodies, there's huge resources in the asteroids. There are some people who just have um, a thing about Mars. Mm -hmm. But but the moon and a few near Earth asteroids are probably enough to keep us occupied for the next half century or so. Yeah, that's a tremendous potential, um, both scientific and and resource source. Think about stuff like if we could choose an area of study that we'd like to do one huge one to understand our universe better. One huge one would be a really high resolution radio telescope in a really radio quiet place 
And the radio quietest place in a solar system would be a place close to Earth, but with a lot of shielding. The dark side of the moon. Couple far side. You got to learn to say far side because it's not dark. Uh-huh. Because it, both sides get the same amount of light. Yeah. But the lunar far side, you got you got a couple thousand miles of rock. You could build something like the Arecibo radio antenna, radio telescope, in a crater on the far side. Oh my god, we don't know what we discover. There's so you'd have you'd have this radio quiet that exists nowhere on this planet. It would be so quiet. The sensitivity could be amazing. And we know we'd find things that would bowl us over. We just don't know what they'd be. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a big lobbyist for, please give us a giant radio telescope on the far side. You know, that would be, that'd be a huge scientific boom. And, um, yeah, the lunar far side, the, the volatiles on the, uh, in, in the polar regions, the fact that you can have a, a thriving base within a, a few days travel time of the Earth in case there are medical problems. You can rotate crews easily. To me, the moon's the moon is staring us right in the face, going, "I'm here. This is where you go first to learn how to function in the rest of of the myriad airless rocky bodies all over the solar system." So you've got a toolkit for moving out. And if you also bear in mind, you can go to Deimos and Phobos, mm-hmm. tunnel into that rock. Rock's a pretty good radiation shield. You know, we can learn to be. You know, we're pretty good at mining technology. You can pressurize tunnels and have a ready-made base. You can. There's even a concept called bubble worlds, where you you you, you take a smallish asteroidal body, made of with with the right metals, and you you put a heat source inside it. You start heating it up, and you start spinning it, and you start hollowing it out, and you can wind up with a rough sphere or a toroid, a donut shape, that you can and you just just kind of. Ho- Make a hollow in it, and then let it cool. And it's it's a huge engineering project over years, but it's all really doable. And um, and you got a you basically got a, a giant spinning um, hollow chamber that you could spin to the spin gravity level you need. Final question, because uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, I'm probably also boring you. I can go on, I can go on forever on this stuff. What things should people be excited about for the future of space exploration in, say, the next 50 years? We are a species that seems to be unable to control its population. That will kill us in the long run. All of the, all of the characteristics of humanity that made us the dominant species on this planet will, in the long run, kill us. We're competitive. We're, we're, we're smart, competitive, rapacious and we breed like rabbits and we're going to cons- we're going to eat our own tail we're going to consume our world if we don't get out there and start using utilizing resources off this planet we are going to destroy this beautiful world we have if we don't stop um despoiling it and too many of- we're already past the number of people that can support comfortably um I think we desperately need to get out and start utilizing space resources because that's a source because we have to create, we have to create wealth because only a few rich people right now can have, can have nice lives. Most people are not living very nice lives. If we can expand the range of human options and we can create wealth out there, I think humanity's got better prospects. I think it's a much less dystopian future than having a population that's either controlled by force or by disease and war because mother nature will, will correct for us. We might be experiencing a bit of that right now. Um, I don't like the idea of a, of a world that's, that's closed and we're trapped here. I think if we get out, I, people who are disgusted with humanity and think we're just locusts, well, maybe they're right, but I think sentient life which i know stephen hawking used to joke that he's not sure there's intelligent life on the earth but consciousness i think is worth saving and getting us off planet is a way to save it because it'd be really stupid to get knocked off like the dinosaurs we can tell that the asteroid's coming let's get off planet let's we've got a beautiful solar system out there 
exploring it is exci is exciting. It maybe even be as exciting as making war on one another. Maybe we could, maybe we could do that instead, <laughs> and do it together, and and find that exciting and challenging. I did. I'm I'm an optimist about that stuff. I think I think we could do that and maybe not kill each other, because the solar system will kill a lot of us along the way. It will be dangerous and exciting, and and challenging and take the best of our energies and i think it's a good future as opposed to a new here. enemy to conquer yeah we don't we don't have to conquer we, we can we can do it i don't like the, the conquest ethos so much because we have to get over that 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 aggressive ethos we but, but we can be better we can be nicer to our mother the earth basically because we've really been beating the snot out of her and she needs she needs a little help and us leaving can help her we can get the dirty stuff off the surface of this planet. And because my generation has not moved very much. And I'm really disappointed in, in my generation. You know, we should have been moving ahead. We should have been getting off fossil fuels by now. We haven't done it and we need to. And like I said, stuff like space, solar and doing mining in other places would, would help. You know, so let's go. Awesome. I'm sorry, I can't go. I'm just too old now. Yeah. 